our next speaker before coffee break is Dr. Elian uh, Ramos from the National in, uh, Human Gene Genome Research Institute. And we have learned a lot about monogenetic auto-inflammatory disease, so she will tell us a little bit uh, more about disease that is slightly more complex. And often we see the disease along the Silk Road. Please. Thank you. I also would like to uh, congratulate Dan for his uh, award. And uh, I should also tell you that it's been my distinct pleasure and honor to uh, work with him over the last more than 20 years now. I'm going to be talking about genetic factors and Bechet's disease, a journey on and off the Silk Road. Bechet's disease is named for the Turkish dermatologist Lucy Bechet, who described three patients in 1937 with oral and genital ulceration, you see at the pictures at the bottom of this slide, uh, hypopion uveitis, which is this collection of pus in the eye here, and erythema nodosum. We now recognize Bechet's disease as a multi-system inflammatory disease uh, affecting a variety, wide range of organs and tissue. The ocular disease includes anterior uve uveitis, relapsing hypopion, vitritis and retinal vasculitis, and these forms, these, these diseases are a leading cause of vision loss in populations that have come, that have high frequency of Bechet's disease. Aphthous ulcers can affect the entire GI tract, and uh, Crohn's disease kind of, lesions look really similar to the, uh, or the, uh, the uh, Bechet's lesions look very similar to Crohn's disease. Genital uh, ulceration, I've already talked about. Deep venous occlusions and arthritis, generally of large joints, non-destructive. Life-threatening cardiovascular disease includes ischemic heart disease and cardiac pulmonary and peripheral vessel aneurysms. The skin lesions include folliculitis, erythema nodosum, and the pathogen response in which a sterile needle uh, is used to induce an inflammatory response on the skin that Bechet's patients will respond to, but uh, people without don't. The nervous system includes parenchymal brain disease as well as cerebral and sinus thrombosis. So you can see there's a lot of different inflammatory conditions here, but no recognized disease-specific autoantibodies and no identified antigen-specific T cells, so it falls into the rubric of the auto of autoinflammatory disease. So, what are the genetic contributions to Bechet's disease? Uh, unlike the monogenic diseases we've been talking about, most of the cases are sporadic. There's some te tendency to run in families, and you can quantify that by finding that 10 to 50-fold increased disease risk is found in siblings of affected probands whereas, uh, com when they're compared to the rate in the general population. There's a marked distribution along the silk routes with highest prevalences in Turkey, Iran, and Japan. And so there was the uh, implication that perhaps some genetic factors might be shared there. An MHC class one genetic factor, HLA-B51, was identified in 1973 by Professor Ono, and it, was, it confers an odds ratio of greater than three, but still accounts for less than 30% of the GZ's genetic risk. So it uh, fits into the category of genetically complex disease, to complex autoinflammatory disease, with numerous, generally with numerous genetic factors that likely interact with each other and with environmental factors to produce this multi-system inflammatory disease. So the genetic architecture of rare and common diseases varies with Mendelian diseases having very low allele frequency variants that contribute each with very large effect. And uh, as opposed to what we generally find in genetically complex diseases, that we find high frequency or common variants that are associated that with, with small effects that c combine to generate disease risk. So I'm going to be talking about Silk Road on the Silk Road, 
which is a common, uh, populations in which Bechet's disease is common. And this uh, is generally, or these genetic factors are generally studied in genome-wide association studies. But I'm also going to mention a little bit about Bechet's disease off the Silk Road. When we move off into populations off the Silk Road, Bechet's disease is much more rare. And uh, we found that uh, we've been able to identify some Bechet-like disease in which, uh, with linkage and whole exome sequencing studies, have identified uh, monogenic forms of disease. So, uh, as I said, for genetic factors for common diseases, we generally need to use, uh, we do perform genome-wide association studies, and these studies require really large numbers of unrelated cases and controls to be powered to detect those tiny uh, differences uh, in the uh, effect, with the low psi with small effects with a high degree of conf confidence. Generally, the strategies are to perform a discovery, replicate the findings, and perform meta-analysis. So we collaborated with Ahmet Gul at Istanbul University with, and obtained a collection of 1,200 Turkish cases and very well-matched controls about the same size and genotyped them on an Illumina array, array with 311,000 SNPs. In the initial GWAS studies, this is the Manhattan plot that we caught. Uh, the uh, dots each represent a single variant going across the entire genome, and the size of the significance of the, of the association are shown. And the size skyscraper scraper in, the in the Manhattan plot is the MHC. And then we see a few other small signals in the suggestive range that are circled over here. So just to uh, fill in a little bit with the, about the HLA region, both uh, Mike Umbrello and um, Masaki Takeuchi worked on this MHC studies. And you can see in the Manhattan pod, if we zoom in, this is with a few more samples than in the previous study, if we zoom in on the association of SNPs that includes imputed SNPs and imputed classical HLA types. Um, all these blue markers show the HLA association. And the top marker there marked with a star is HLA, an imputed HLA B51 itself. If you then condition on the association that you find with HLA B51, you can see in green the association that remains. And these are all below the level of genome-wide significance. And uh, over here, we still have um, some uh, significant associations. And if we just look at these uh, in the table, you can see we have a really nice association of B51. And after conditioning on B51, we still have a significant association for HLA-A03. But the odds ratio now is less than one, so that means Carrying a, a o, O3 is actually protective instead of contributing to risk. And if you then put a O3 in the mix, you continue and find a second HLA B locus, B15, that's associated with the disease. Okay, but what about all the, uh, the non HLA suggestive associations? Could we um, do replication studies and find any associated condition there? And we did. We found two of the loci, one within IL-10 gene and one within a region encompassing IL-23 receptor and IL-12 receptor beta. Two genes were significant. I see had significant p-values with reasonable odds, odds ratios for genome-wide association studies. And if we're looking more carefully at the function of the non-coding variants in IL-10, uh, which encodes an anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10, we found that the variants were associated with reduced IL-10 expression um, induced by LBS-stimulated PBMCs and TLR ligand-stimulated mon monocytes. Looking at the uh, IL-23 receptor, IL-12 receptor, region alleles in our initial paper, we couldn't really clarify whether it was one or both genes. 
Subsequent studies have pointed to the IL-23 receptor gene in which the GWAS non-coding variants and two low-frequency missense variants, one is R381Q in Turkish and the other is G149R in Japanese, reduced T-cell response to IL-23 are associated with protection against from Bechet's disease. And this is similar to shown in Crohn's disease, psoriasis, and ankylosing spondylitis. Well, there must be additional genetic factors. We were happy to get some, but that's not really explaining much of disease. So what could we do to find additional genetic, genetic factors? Well, Yohei Carino took, and a group took this on, and he first decided to increase SNP coverage. And one way to do that without actually performing more genotyping is to use imputation and then increase the size of replication coll collections would give us greater power. And then he had a couple of other tricks up his sleeve, reducing genetic heterogeneity and increasing power by looking at phenotypic subsets, testing other genetic models, and evaluating gene-gene interactions. So this is our second generation GWAS and re results. And this was from the same discovery collection because we'd only done the genotyping initially with this distinct uh, pet category. And, but using those other methods of uh, increasing the, in particular increasing the replication cohort. And the first thing he found were non-coding variants in CCR1, CCR3, the genes encoding chemokine receptors one and three. They're important for recruitment of effector immune cells. And so he looked at functional outcomes of those variants and found that the uh, non-coding variants were associated with decreased CCR1 expression and decreased CCR1-dependent monocyte migration. And this suggested an impaired immune cell recruitment response to microbes. Now, I've marked that in red so that you can sort of recall this theme as we go along a little bit here. He also identified coding variants in KLRC4 on chromosome 12, isoleucine 29 to serine and an asparagine 104 to serine. And it's one of several killer-like lectin-like receptors that have been implicated in regulation of NK cell function. And then he found non-coding variants in STAT, the STAT4 gene encoding a transcription factor important to Th1 T cell differentiation with a reasonable significance and odds ratio. Expression studies that he performed showed that the disease-associated allele was associated with higher gene expression. Um, actually, first looking in, uh, in uh, databases of, gene, of EQTLs. And then the thing we noticed, uh, STAT4 is very important in autoimmune diseases, complex autoimmune diseases, and it's been shown in particular in rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, but the variants that were associated in those autoimmune disease were independent of the variants that were found in Bechet's disease, and vice versa. So on the, the last thing he did was under, a, he used a recessive model. He found three coding variants in ERAP1 to be show, uh, associated with disease, and the effect was first identified in the subset of patients with uveitis. So he was trying subsets of patients and then um, different models and so used recessive model and showed that he had significance and then showed that the, the association was actually limited to HLA-B51 positive individuals. So what is ERAP1? ERAP1 is the endoplasmic reticulum associated aminopeptidase 1. It's the enzyme that's responsible for trimming intracellular derived peptides to the optimal length for loading onto MHC class 1 molecules. And this is just a, a cartoon of that. You can see the precursor peptides are imported into the endoplasmic reticulum, but then are redu uh, reduced in size by ERAP1 and loaded onto MHC class 1 which is then makes its way out to the cell surface. 
Uh, in Bechet's disease, the disease risk genotypes were associated with increased disease risk in, in, in individuals carrying B51, and I'll show you a little more about that. So ERAP1, it turns out, is a protein that has a fair number of coding variants in the world, and in Turkey, there are t eight different ha allotypes that are encoded by these eight different haplotypes that account for 98.8% of the haplotypes in tur the Turkish controls. You say, well, in, in the individual, the, in the spe specific um, variants aren't acting in isolation. They're acting on the, the allotype that they're encoded on. So we looked for association of the individual haplotypes or allotypes. And in the next slide, the top bottom line of the table shows that HAP10 is the only one, the one with valine, arginine, asparagine, glutamine, and glutamic acid, uh, is the only one that is associated with disease. And you can see this association here with a p-value of 3 times 10 to the minus 6. The amino acids that are marked in yellow are the non-ancestral amino acids, whereas the uh, alter, the un unlabeled ones were the same as in primates. So looking on this uh, forest pot, you can see the original, the data all together at the bottom. There's a p-value of 3 times 10 to the minus 6. But if you divide these into the HB51 negative individuals and the HB51 positive individuals, you can see that all of the association is coming from the HB, HLA-B51 positive individuals, whereas nothing is coming from the B51 individuals. And we have a nice genome-wide associated p-value for those positive individuals. This is a picture showing the structure of um, ERAP1, and the star, it shows the, the location of the catalytic site, site where the cu cu cutting occurs, and HAP10 has these yellow marked amino acid changes within it. And that HAP10 has been reported to have a very poor peptide trimming activity, and homozygosity for HAP10 could greatly alter the composition of the peptidome available for binding to HLA-B51. It could fail to produce disease-protective peptides by failing to trim precursors, or it could fail to digest and destroy the disease-promoting peptides. Could actually either way. Identifying the nature and source of such peptides, uh, for example, are they self-derived or do they come from commensals and would be important towards elucidating mechanisms by which B51 contributes to Bachet's risk. Interestingly, this, these associations that we'd found till this point started aligning Bachet's disease with other MHC class 1 associated diseases, ankylosing spondylitis and psoriasis. They all have MHC class 1 associations no recognized autoantibodies or autoantigen-specific T cells. They have IL-23 receptor associations. They have ERAP1 associations that are, are specific to the, uh, associate, to the uh, individuals with the HLA, associated HLA type, class 1 type. And they all have strong interactions between MHC class 1 and ERAP1. So these may pro provide clues for some shared pathogenesis and shared op treatment options among class 1 associated diseases. So the next thing uh, Yohei Carino decided to investigate were some low frequency variants to see whether low sequence frequency variants might contribute to Bechet's disease as well as common variants. And so he took a target, targeted list of uh, 10 GWAS identified genes and 11 innate immune genes and sequenced them by next generation sequencing um, technology in a panel of individuals to discover uh, genes that would be increased. And, and then evaluated it in a, lar a larger collection, the very 
those variants for an increased burden of rare and low frequency non-synonymous variants in cases compared with controls. First thing he found, surprisingly, was our old friend MEF VM694V. So that's an important FMF mutation. It was strongly associated with Bechet's disease in the Turkish population, an odds ratio 2.65 and a p-value of 1.8 times 10 to minus 12th was pretty convincing that we had something. And these were not occult FMF patients in the uh, population because we didn't find a second mutation in any of them. As well as MEFV M694V, we found that IL-23 receptor, TLR4, and NOD2 had significantly different burdens of non-synonymous, rare, and low-frequency variances in cases compared with controls. Okay, the next thing we decided to do is to, um, invest, to try and uh, investigate other immune-related loci in a more dense fa and comprehensive fashion. By, and uh, Masaki Takeuchi in the lab took this on and we genotyped um, our, our collection, our new collection of Bechet's disease individuals with the immunochip, which has more than 200,000 markers that were designed from 12 immune-related disease, and they're in the box here, you can read. But the thing that's important, they include ankylosing spondylitis and psoriasis, these other MHC class one diseases. So we thought this might be a good source of finding additional Bechet's lo loci. And used an expanded Turkish Bechet's disease discovery collection and two replication cohorts, including an Iranian cohort with 969 cases and 826 controls, and a Japanese cohort with 608 cases and 737 controls. And here's the, uh, the Manhattan plot from the discovery section, the, the stage of the analysis. And what's important here is I've marked in red all the new loci that were either significant at this stage of screening or became genome-wide significant after the replica, including the replication and meta-analysis, or maybe using another uh, genetic model. And I'll just talk about a couple of these loci because they're so interesting. And the first is, Go back. IL-1A, IL-1B, they're quite located quite close to one another on chromosome two. And we found there's genome-wide significance in this, this is zoomed in association for BD, for uh, association for Bechet's disease susceptibility. And in the second plot, you can see an EQTL analysis it, we uh, downloaded from an EQTL database, and the very same marker that is the top marker for disease association is also the top marker for an, ex, a, an, a, an EQTL for, uh, for inter, interleukin-1 alpha expression. And we also did some analysis of uh, Zymazin studied stimulated PBMCs from, risk allele, uh, from cell, cells with risk alleles, the, CC, the C is a risk allele for IL-1 alpha. And we looked at IL-1 alpha expression in the risk allele compared to the non-risk allele and also uh, for IL-1 alpha and IL-1 beta. And what you can see is that there's decreased IL-1 alpha expression, but increased IL-1 beta expression in the individuals that carry the, uh, are homozygous for the risk allele. So these results suggest the risk allele, allele is associated with impaired skin barrier function because IL-1 alpha is highly expressed in the epidermis and has been shown to play a role in skin barrier functions. And then that decreased expression could then lead to hyper or sustained response to microbes accompanied with increased IL-1 beta expression. And the second gene I wanted to just spend briefly talking about is FUT2 uh, alpha-1,2 fucosyl transferase. 
A FUT2 gene is required for secretion of ABO antigens and homozygosity for loss of function in F FUT2 mutations leads to an ABO non-secretor phenotype. This was already known, but nobody really understood why wow, that might connect with Bechet's disease. And homozygosity of the non-secretor um, mutation was associated with Bechet's disease, and you can see that in this association table here, where the, uh, there's a significant odds ratio and a genome-wide significance p-value for this tryptophan to, to a premature termination at position 143. This replicated very nicely. In the Iranian population, we see almost the same uh, kind of association. And the Japanese don't have that, and that population doesn't have that particular um, non-secretor allele, but there's another common non-secretor allele in that population, isoleucine 129-phenylalanine, and that one also shows the this, this same kind of association of the non-secretor allele with disease, re with disease susceptibility. So there's... The secretory tissues secrete mucin glyco glycoproteins that assemble into mucus layers, and those are shown here with the little blue dots coming out and forming these mucus layers from secretory tissues. And the ability to secrete the ABO antigens, shown in the little red dots, is encoded by the FUT gene. So on the left side of the figure, those uh, are, are, are being secreted. They're not on the right. And the secreted ABO antigens bind to the mucins in the mucus layers. And ABO antigens act as binding sites for bacteria, reducing their access to underlying tissues. So in this cartoon, you can see the green bacteria are binding to the uh, ABO antigens, bound to the mucins. And on the right side of the figure, they're not doing that. And so the bacteria continue making their way down into the... Uh, to, underlying tissue. So ABO non-secretors, I already said that. Redu so the reduced barrier function and increased microbial exposure are associated with Bechet's disease risk again. So ABO non-secretor genotypes have been also been associated with Crohn's disease and some intestinal infections, but interestingly, resistance to some viral infections. That's probably why there is uh, an the non-secretor antigens are so high in the population. So lessons from Bechet's disease on the Silk Road. You can see we have all these interesting genes associated with disease. B51 remains the strongest risk factor for Bechet's disease. Strong associations of B51 and ERAP1 and their interactions support the hypothesis that peptide binding and presentation by MHC class one plays an important role in Bechet's disease susceptibility. And genetic similarities among ankylosing spondylitis, psoriasis, and Bechet's disease, including AIL-23 receptor, MHC class one, and ERAP1 associations, support grouping these diseases into a group of MHC class one opathies and may suggest exploring shared pathogenesis and possibly shared treatment options. And then several of the genetic factors that, that we found associated with the disease influence host barrier function or responses to microbes. And I've listed some of them here that I talked about as well as a couple I haven't. CCR1, IL1A, FUT2, CEBPP, and RIP kinase 2. And functional data suggests that the Bechet's disease-associated alleles of these genes are associated with poor barrier function or diminished responses to microbes or microbial products. Interestingly, we were uh, doing this work with the uh, immunochip, and we've had all those new loci, and we attended an American Society of Human Genetics meeting and saw a presentation by 23andMe of uh, an association study for self-reported canker sores. Now remember the oral ulceration is a very common manifestation in Bechet's disease. And this is just people who said they often have ca ca canker sores. And interestingly, all of the loci that I've marked with these gold stars 
are all are loci that we found genome-wide significance in Bechet's disease, sort of leading to this idea that there's a link in susceptibility loci for disease for two different diseases with similar manifestations. Well, it made us think about another common inflammatory, uh, auto-inflammatory disease, PFAPA. It's periodic fever, aphthous stomatitis, pharyngitis, and adenitis. And we wondered whether any of those eight loci would be associated with PFAPA. And Kalpana Manthram performed a small study. It's really under, underpowered, but it was a good way to just take a, a look at the relationships to see whether, whether we could see some association. And she found that four of the eight significant loci for Bechet's disease and canker sores were also loci for, <coughs> for uh, PFAPA. And so that was kind of remarkable. And so we now suggest that we're looking at a spe Bechet spectrum of disorders. On the left side, with recurrent aphthous stomatitis being very common and sort of the mild end of the, of the phenotype, PFAPA in the middle, and Bechet's disease on the right. And she's going to perform a, a bigger study that would be hopefully be uh, able to enlighten us more with a better powered study. So Bechet's disease off the Silk Road. Once we move, as I said, as we move off the Silk Road, Bechet's disease is too rare to form a GWAS. But we might be able to find some Bechet's like disease cases that are actually suffering from a monogenic autoinflammatory disease. And such cases are likely also hidden among the common complex so, uh, disease in Silk Road populations. One way to go after them is to look for familial or early onset Bechet's like disease. And an example of that is the identification of HA20, the TNA, TNFAIP3 truncating mu or not loss of function mutations. And this was done by exome and Sanger targeted sequencing in families that had something that looked like a familial Bechet's disease. And you can see in family one and family two, we have two premature termination codon mutations in TNFAIP3. And that is the only gene that had in common mutation, uh, a, a common gene for the two families. So we looked further and found with 150 additional pati patients screened, three more families, with all with premature terminations, and then uh, screened 384 Turkish and 384 Bechet's patients that were not selected for being familial. They were just in, in a plate of collection that we tested and found one more for Turkish family when we went back and asked uh, Ahmet to check if there were any other uh, family members so affected. So this uh, was strong evidence that we had identified an association of haploinsufficiency of TNFAIP3, uh, or we call it A A A20, um, we call it HA20. So there are other auto monogenic autoinflammatory diseases that may present as Bechet's like disease, not in all patients, or maybe they will have nearly um, uh, diagnosable Bechet's disease. And some of them, some of the list of some of them are, are here. You can see we have a nice, uh, I won't go through the individual ones, but the, we can expect to maybe find some other monogenic forms of Bechet's disease. We know that there are other families that we haven't found a gene yet, and maybe we still can. So to discover, to discover novel autoinflammatory diseases, we should probably focus first on patients on or off the Silk Road with familial or early onset Bechet's disease. Uh, if we go, as we get more aggressive at sequencing, we might even continue into the Silk Road populations as well. And the genes that cause monogenic autoinflammatory diseases that mimic Bechet's disease might be exploited to develop effective therapeutics for more commonly more common genetically complex Bechet's disease, or to provide other infl uh, inflammatory disease treatments. 
And that's all I have to say. So I'd like to acknowledge, of course, Dan Kessner for making the, all of this work possible, this interesting and interesting work that I've been able to do. And of course, all of our collaborators and many of which uh, I didn't put everybody up in the, on the, in, the, in the group, but the key people here are marked. Thank you.